I'm just checking my email. You know. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the first event for the Spring 2023 Common Word Community Read, curated by me. My name is Wiley Cash, I'm the class of 2000. I serve as the alumni author in residence here at UNC Asheville, where I teach classes in fiction writing and literature. My selection this semester is The Other Dr. Gilmer, Two Men, A Murder, and an Unlikely Fight for Justice, by local physician, Dr. Benjamin Gilmer, who is actually joining us here tonight. So everybody be engaged. <laughs> Dad is here to make sure you all read the book. Over the past several weeks, I've heard from countless readers, both online and in person, who have been absolutely blown away by this book. From its beautiful storytelling, to its great characterization, to its stunning and suspenseful plot twist, to its heart for advocacy. It tells the true story of the shocking murder committed by Asheville physician Dr. Vince Gilmer, his trial, imprisonment, and the secrets and medical mysteries that were untangled by Dr. Benjamin Gilmer a few years later. A man who not only shared Vince's last name, but who worked in Vince's footsteps and served their patients with the same care, humility, and grace with which Benjamin would later serve this story. The goal of the Common Read is to unite the campus and the community each semester by exploring the issues found in a single text. And what better place to do that than here at UNC Asheville? And what better building to host such explorations than the Reuters Center, which is home to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute? All the members are a vital part of this community at UNC Asheville, and I'm honored that so many of them, so many of you, have joined us in this adventure. Thomas Wolfe, who was North Carolina's second most famous native writer, once wrote, the first is Nicholas Sparks. Uh, Thomas <laughs> Wolfe, you thought it was going to be me, didn't you? You're like, I don't think it's why. <laughs> Thomas Wolfe once wrote that every moment is a window on all time. This is a moment. Friends, this, this is a moment. This is a literary moment in the history of this institution. Along with Common Word, we're using the literary arts to bring writers to campus. This semester, we'll be hosting Ta-Nehisi Coates, National Book Award-winning author of Between the World and Me, United States Poet Laureate Ada Lamone, and beloved local author and National Book Award winner Charles Frazier for the release of his new novel. This summer, here on campus for the Asheville Ideas Fest, we'll be hosting major writers and thinkers, including Kwame Alexander. We are also using the literary arts to give writers space to work, and I'm thrilled that this summer we'll be hosting our inaugural Wilma Dykeman Writer in Residence in Wilma Dykeman's former home in the Beaver Dam community. Soon, we'll be using the literary arts to give writers a place to learn, dream, and write when we host the first cohort of our low residency MFA program, which will be, when we found it and get it going, the only public low residency writing program in the state, and one of the few in the nation. This is a moment, and I am thrilled to be sharing it with you. If you would like to take part in this moment with your experience, with your ideas, with your wisdom, please do not hesitate to contact me at wcash at unca.edu, or you can reach me through my website, wileycash.com. We have a very exciting event in store for you tonight from Dr. Laura Meadows, Assistant Professor of Mass Communication here at UNC Asheville. Before I go any further, you need to know that Dr. Meadows is one of those professors who, when her name is mentioned, students go, oh, I love her. <laughs> so no pressure. She has published and lectured widely on issues ranging from politics and truth, the role of the public intellectual, creating, negating, and perpetuating fabricated controversies, and an analysis of the ways in which mainstream print media covered Barack Obama's religious identity. Dr. Meadows will deliver her talk, How to Get Away with Writing About Murder. At the end, if you have questions, she is more than willing to take them. And if you want to appreciate the full scope of the Common Word Community Read, including a reading guide that I authored, interviews with Dr. Benjamin Gilmer, including the episode of This American Life that tells part of this story, and the full list of this semester's events, 
please go to unca.commonword.edu slash common word, and that will all be there for you. But now, Dr. Lauren Meadows. distress of our students and teach a class on media law. <laughs> um, I tend to write about things at the intersection of uh, media and politics and social movements. Um, um, and also, some people get really curious but are too polite to ask, so I'll tell you I'm six foot three. <laughs> um, how many true crime fans we have? A few. Uh, any favorite true crime stories? Dr. Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert. We'll leave it at that. That's the best one. I'll be gone in the dark. Okay, I'll check that out. I'm just looking for recommendations at this point. <laughs> um, let's do something. I made this pretty PowerPoint for you, so we'll use this. Um, I think it's in our nature to love true crime. Um, and I think um, we do love true crime. There's something necessary about it. Um, but how do you do it the right way? Um, this would be a good time to thank the one and only Wiley Cash for the title, How to Get Away with Writing About Murder. That's his idea. Um, but what, what I want to talk about tonight are um, what kind of cases should creators choose when they're thinking about a true crime story? Um, cold cases, gory crime scenes, baffling circumstances, the wrong verdict. Um, sympathetic victims are the most powerful killers. Like, where should we train our attention? Um, and in short, how do we do true crime ethically? That's what we're going to get into today. <laughs> we have Dr. Gilmer on one side of the screen and Joe Exotic on the other. Right? Um, how many of y'all watched true? Or, how many of you watched Tiger King? Admit it, you did <laughs> I'm still angry at the friends that it recommended to me during the pandemic, but they recommended it to me, you had to watch this. Um, and I'm still frustrated with myself for lacking the moral force to, to turn it off. <laughs> um, I think most true crime falls into a few categories. You have stories about ser serial killers, uh, white female murder victims, oftentimes, and then well-known cases of the elite abusing their power. Um, but as Dr. Gilmore's book makes clear, you can do true crime ethically. You can do it really well. Um, you can be self-reflective. You can advocate on someone's behalf while still telling a really fascinating story. Um, or you can take the Tiger King route and sensationalize the story for viewership. So I think you have options in this genre, and we see a little bit of everything. Um, and these are obviously extreme examples, um, but they set up a continuum between ethical true crime and not so ethical true crime. And we're going to talk more about the differences between the two. Um, my students know this, so I love to start out with a small history lesson, get into it. Um, these pictures come from the 19th century, from the era of the penny press. When newspapers, newspaper publishers realized they could make more money through advertising dollars than through subscriptions, so they sold ads and made their paper available to the public for a penny. And this led directly to the period of yellow journalism, uh, where sensationalism reigned. Um, as you can imagine, true crime stories did very well during this period. Um, the newspapers of that century printed amazingly detailed accounts of murders and victims and in-depth reporting of trials that allowed readers to parse evidence for themselves, and much like we do nowadays, just without Twitter. Um, <laughs> flash forward about 50 years in the early and mid 20th century, pulp fiction no novels and magazines such as True Detective catered to crime buffs. Um, in the 1940s alone, true crime or true detective sold 2 million copies a month, 
mostly featuring terrified women on the cover, and almost always white women. Um, we'll get back to this problematic point later. Anyone in here read In Cold Blood? Uh, yes, you have, absolutely. Um, it's about the brutal murder of four members of the Clutter family, um, pictured at the bottom left, by the two men at the top, uh, Perry Smith and Dick Hickok, in a small Kansas town. Um, the town just didn't know that sort of violence beforehand, and then they did, and Truman Capote was there to write about it, with Harper Lee doing a significant part of the research, as should be noted. Um, but Capote wrote his, he called it a non-fiction novel. Um, he wrote about the murder of this family um, in a really dark, detailed, memorable way, um, even if many of the details were pure fiction. Right? The, ending, the book ends with a scene with one of the investigators meeting a friend of one of the victims, and it just didn't happen. Right? So um, we have to consider whether you could have something called a non-fiction novel. Can you use those types of tools and still tell a true story? Um, but what this book did do was launch our modern true crime era. This is sort of the beginning of that. Um, the 1980s and 90s saw a slew of made-for-TV movies. Um, I saw media outlets like Core TV launch. And then we had the O.J. Simpson verdict in 1995, which I think for most of us in the room, we remember what a spectacle that became. Um, all these trends, plus the surge in procedural uh, police dramas, it did help create a society of people with much greater familiarity with the legal process. We got better at the criminal justice system, the ins and outs, what an appeal looked like, what the mechanisms were for um, introducing evidence, things like that. And so we became much more nuanced in our understanding of the criminal justice system and how it works. Um, from a book publishing perspective, true crime is still relatively small. Um, as of 2020, none of the big five book publishers had a dedicated true crime imprint. Um, however, its cultural sway is immense, in large part because of podcasts, documentaries, and docuseries. Um, 2014, 2015 saw Serial hit our um, iPhones. Um, when this first launched, it was all my friends could talk about. How many of y'all have listened to it? If you haven't, it's worth a listen. It's truly remarkable. Um, it's a brilliant storyteller searching for the truth. It's, it's amazing. And it works for a lot of reasons, I think. Um, but no, none more so than that the creator and host was so self-reflective throughout. She talked about her doubts and talked about what issues presenting evidence in a fair way and sort of let you in on the process, um, which I think worked. And I think that's another reason Dr. Gilmore's work works so well, in part for the same reasons. There's a lot of self-reflection in this. You can kind of be along for the journey um, and not feel like evidence is being contorted to make you feel a certain way. Um, true, crime, true crime podcasting has been called an audio gold mine. Uh, according to one sur survey, it was the third most popular genre in the medium in 2020, outpacing sports and even politics during an election year. So true crime in podcasting is a phenomenon. And how to outpace sports is beyond me. <laughs> um, the picture on the right is from HBO, so the jinx, the life and deaths of Robert Durst. And the picture on the left is Netflix's Making a Murderer. Um, as I said, we're seeing a rise of true crime documentaries. Um, more than 19 million people watched Making a Murderer in the first 35 days after its debut in December 2015. And there have been documentaries before that that had garnered some attention, such as The Thin Blue Line, Paradise Lost, or Capturing the Freedmans. But they weren't supported by a delivery system like Netflix. <clears throat> That, that technology is fundamentally changing how we consume this genre. Um, so in the case of Making the Murderer on the left, um, we all have Netflix, so word of mouth was a really big deal. That's how I heard about it, it was through somebody else. Um, all 10 episodes were available at once, so we could binge it, which obviously makes us happy. 
Um, and the story, the is he or is he not guilty uh, aspect was captivating. Um, I remember watching the first seven episodes in a row on one Saturday, rushing out to dinner, eating as fast as I could, and <laughs> rushing back to like a finished series. And I don't binge things and can't sit still. Um, so it really was pretty remarkable. And then you find out later that there was maybe some problematic aspects as far as the editing goes, and the evidence that was presented maybe wasn't the fullest picture. Um, but then HBO had their show, The Jinx, which had that amazing reveal, which if you haven't seen it, I can't tell you about. But um, another show that maybe had a little bit of problematic editing in it, but made for a very lively and entertaining um, show. Um, some data suggests that these types of documentaries increase subscriber retention. So Netflix will keep you as a Netflix subscriber if they play you plenty of documentaries because we're eating them up as fast as we put them out. Um, and as you can imagine, this is crucial for these platforms. Um, additionally, they're cheaper than scripted shows to produce, they don't have sets, they don't have costumes, they don't have actors. And so platforms are meeting demand while also keeping costs down. Everybody is winning. We're getting our true crime fix, they're getting their subscribers. Um, we all win. Um, but there's, uh, I said, well, but, and there's always a but, right? Uh, and that is, why is true crime problematic? Uh, we'll go through each one of these, but um, these are just some of the reasons true crime can be problematic. Um, factual storytelling versus entertainment, interactive entertainment, consumers can become paranoid or afraid. Um, the way we deal with victims can be problematic, and then we'll get into what I mean by missing white woman syndrome. So factual story time, storytelling versus entertainment, and let's let's stay up front that entertainment in and of itself is not the problem, right? Um, in fact, it's completely necessary. If something's not entertaining, we're not going to read it, we're not going to watch it, we're not going to listen to it. That's the fact of it. Um, if it. If it doesn't catch our attention and maintain our attention in this attention economy, um, then it might as well not exist, whatever good it's trying to do for the world. Um, but there's a line between entertaining and sensationalism that sometimes gets crossed, I think. Um, nowadays, we have super sharp graphics. We have dramatic musical cues. It used to be sort of a faux pas to have a musical cue in some documentaries because it was you're trying to lure the audience one way or another emotionally. But that seems to be a thing of the past. Um, not to mention cliffhangers and twists, right? No more so than the jinx, I think, if you've seen that. Um, and some true crime stories go all the way into sensationalism. Uh, as in Tiger King, and they play at the looks and speech and overall outrageousness of the characters and the circumstances. Um, and the, the reality remains that often works for viewers. Sometimes you get caught up in a story like that, you want to finish it, you want to watch it. Um, but should we let it do that to us? There's so much good content out there. Where are we, where are we giving our attention? Um, are these the types of stories we should pour our limited attention into, or should we be a little more uh, strategic than that. Um, crime can become crime can become interactive entertainment when innocent people are caught up in investigations and blamed for crimes they did not commit. So, for instance, in Idaho, after the recent shooting of four Idaho college students. As one writer has said, the real crime, as the weeks dragged on, became a true crime. So it stopped being about real people and became about a story, and about entertainment, and about being able to interact with those, with those elements. Um, baseless rumors spread online, as folks with no connection to the case became obsessed with it. Um, one Facebook group dedicated to the crime has roughly 230,000 members. Um, some subreddits have more than 100,000 members each. And all their online activity has complicated the on-the-ground investigation, um, creating more victims when innocent folks are called to account, um, when their due process is taken away, 
by an enraged online mob who thinks they have the answer. Their intentions may be good, but when they step over a line, it becomes problematic. Um, so in short, there's a fine line between advocating for a cause and getting caught up in a virtual witch hunt. Um, sometimes consumers of true crime become a little bit paranoid. Right? It's scary. It's a scary world out there. It can be. And when you consume these stories, that starts to take on a bigger life of its own in your mind. Um, has anyone in here heard of the mean, the mean world syndrome? We got a media scholar in the audience. They've heard of it. <laughs> um, so if you haven't, then that's great. So we can learn something. Um, mean World Syndrome was proposed by a comms professor named George Gerbner, um, and he said that we have a cognitive bias, whereas the more media we consume, the more afraid of the world we become. Um, we perceive it to be more dangerous than it actually is. Um, specifically, the more news we watch and the more police dramas we consume, the more afraid we become. We start to think we're more likely to be the victim of a crime the more we watch. And we start to think there are more people employed in criminal justice than actually are. Um, and study after study has confirmed these ideas. Um, in regards to true crime, it stands to reason that the more we consume, the more afraid we become. And some survey evidence um, bears that out. So um, that might be kind of small to see, so I'll just kind of read out the numbers. But this ask if you if is there more crime in your area than there was a year ago or less? Seventy eight percent of people think there's more crime nationally than there was a year ago. And then the other number is in your local area, and that number is actually going down. So we, we know our local area pretty well because we could say that maybe crime isn't going up, but on a national level, we're taking cues from the media we consume and making assumptions about how dangerous the world is. And this is just sort of an interesting difference that I thought I would point out. Um, there's a difference based on our politics. Um, We're close to you all then. <laughs> <laughs> they won't let you leave now even if you want to. <laughs> 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 um, so Republicans are more likely to think that there's more crime in the U.S. than a year ago as opposed to Democrats by about 10%. I'm not sure why that is, but it does seem that we're divided in every way that you can be right now. So. Um, sometimes some true crime stories push victims to the background, I think. Um, these stories become problematic when they decenter the victim turning the victim into a statistic or even a prop. Um, when stories lose track of the life that's been erased, they lose their heart, I think, and flood into more ethically murky waters. Um, I think it's also it, worth acknowledging it's necessary to examine the perpetrators of crime to understand the evil. Like, that's not an unworthy endeavor. Um, and it can be really beneficial in ways, but I think you always have to find ways to honor the fact that there is a victim who had a life that was cut short. Um, finally, missing white woman syndrome. Glenn Eiffel, a reporter, coined that phrase a while back. Um, just to make the point that even though men of color are disproportionately the victims of violent crime, uh, most true crime continues to focus their storytelling on violence against white women. And I just wish I would always make a better point, attractive white women, absolutely. Um, similarly, other folks who are disproportionately likely to become victims of violent crime include sex workers, the homeless, and trained women, and these folks are typically erased from true crime stories. Um, we just simply do not see stories featuring these vulnerable groups. Um, collectively, these omissions work to create an idea of what constitutes victimhood, what makes a victim. We have very kind of firm ideas, I think, for, for what constitutes a victim. And that can be problematic. Um, there's obviously advantages, it's not a bad story. So, um, but before I go on, any questions that you'll have before I go on to the next section? Any pushback? 
that in Tuttle Green? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you left out the missing Indian women. There were lots of Indian girls. I did leave that out. I should not have done that. Right. Okay. Good point. All right, they're from the same page, I'll keep going. Um, so um, there's more sophisticated storytelling than ever before. Um, these types of stories are sustaining attention for a lot longer and um, pushing us toward change. So we'll jump into that. So more sophisticated storytelling with more in-depth examinations of the intricacies of the criminal justice system writ large. Um, as I mentioned earlier, audiences are much more legally savvy than they've ever been. So producers and storytellers can tell more advanced, more layered, more nuanced narratives. And that's to all of our advantage, I think. Um, and these true crime consumers, many of them anyway, are more aware of the flaws in the justice system including police brutality and wrongful convictions. And this opens up storytellers to examine different, different types of victims, including a diversity of races, ethnicities, genders, and circumstances. So because we're more nuanced, storytelling can get better. Um, most of us are here because we have been pulled into a true crime story, right? We know it can sustain our attention. Um, and it draws attention for a sustained period of time. In our accelerated news cycle, stories pop up and flame out all the time. I know most of us get alerts on our phone, you'll read it, you don't hear about it again after that. It's, it's, it's like one-off news storytelling that we're getting. Um, we're not seeing that as much with true crime. It's sustaining our attention for much longer. Um, especially in serialized true crime found in podcasts and docu-series, audiences by necessity, focus their gaze on the story for much longer. It becomes more part of the zeitgeist than a trending topic on Twitter or a TikTok video. We're, we're tuned in for longer. Um, this attention can and has led to meaningful change. The wrongly convicted have been exonerated, new trials have come about, and cold cases have been solved. So, all very positive things. And by highlighting the flaws in our criminal justice system, true, true crime can move us closer to reformative change. So we don't have to tell the same stories about the same victims we can branch out and do more. Um, I want to propose a possible ethically sound path forward. My advocacy journalism students are in on this. Um, when creators are deciding which cases to take on, how should they decide? And I think the virtues of advocacy journalism might be a really solid guidepost. So. Um, advocacy journalism is the use of journalism techniques to promote specific political or social causes. A, an easy way to say it is reporting with a point of view. So, as opposed to objective reporting with the journalist tries to be as unbiased as possible, the journalist in this instance comes in with an idea, like I think the criminal justice system is broken and I would like to fix it in some small way, so what story can I tell? That sort of thing. Um, they're not trying to be objective, they're not trying to be neutral, they acknowledge what bias they might have and work from that position. There are obviously some critiques of it. One, it, it can lead you to propaganda. You're so committed to your cause that you're willing to do anything to get your point across. Um, if you're not careful, you'll assume certain facts and work from that with blinders on. You have to be willing to see outside your own perspective and be surprised by the evidence that you might find. Um, At the same time, it has the benefit of transparency. You know where um, the writer is coming from. Uh, you know what their perspective is, you know what they're trying to do. And so there's no chance that they're necessarily trying to emotionally pull you one direction or another. They're trying to tell you a story from, from their perspective. Um, 
I think you can make a case that the public interest is served by multiple viewpoints, and we know what those viewpoints are. It makes for a more well-rounded, nuanced um, news and true crime environment. Um, and it's less motivated by a profit motive. They oftentimes work with um, nonprofits to gather information. Best practices would be acknowledge your perspective. Know where you're coming from. Um, be, be clear about that. Like I said, some of the, like Serial was, like Dr. Gilmer's book is. Um, don't take information out of context. So in Cold Blood, for instance, there's a lot of um, conversations that are recorded that they may or may not have taken place in the timeline that the author said that they did. So you're kind of led to believe a story that didn't actually happen the way that they said it did. Um, you want to ask critical questions of everyone. Um, uh, even though you may have a perspective, you can learn from people you agree with and people you don't, and you want to try to do that. You want to present information fairly. Don't trick your audience. Think better than that. Um, use neutral sources to establish facts, police reports, um, trial transcripts, that sort of thing. And nonprofit organizations are a wealth of information, so use those to your advantage as well. Just to sum up a bit, to sustain ethically rigorous true crime stories, our notion of victimhood must change. It's got to become more expansive. We've got to tell bigger, more nuanced stories. Um, we have to move beyond missing white woman syndrome, missing Indian woman syndrome, and delve into stories with the diversity of victims if we're going to truly represent the full complexity of criminality and criminal justice. Um, we must be entertaining, but put a focus on advocacy to ensure that true crime does not devolve into sensationalism. Um, I'd love to hear some questions or comments from y'all, so if you have anything, we can have a discussion. So. Yes, sir? Um. A little dubious about the idea that, that the journalism you propose is less motivated by the profit motive because there are all sorts of advocacy journalism. And just this past week, we've been seeing some, some um, emails that suggest that the advocacy journalism of Fox News was entirely motivated by the profit motive. That if they told the truth about the election, their, sale, their stock price would decline. Now, that's not the advocacy journalism you're recommending. No. But it's actually <laughs> um, I think it's in the same way Tiger King is true crime and Dr. Gelmersberg is true crime. They exist on a continuum. And if you're on the right side of things, on the ethical side of things, you'll do it the right way. And if you're not, you'll still drive your vote based on profit motive. It seems like there's at least some of us that want to know that the story that we're being told is a truthful story that we're not being manipulated. And so it seems like you, well, making a murder, for instance, I watched that captivated, ran off from dinner, watched the whole thing, found out after the fact that it kind of been had a little bit in how the evidence was presented. And so I think the hard part is when, when you're consuming these types of stories, um, you don't know until later on maybe whether something has been ethically done or not. I think that's maybe where the problem comes in. You can try to be as cautious and as informed a consumer as possible, but you still might run into problems. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Mondes, for this fantastic Okay, so ethics in terms of content makers, what about Netflix and their just buying up of do, do we see a place where the people who run Netflix have an ethical obligation to make sure what they put on their streaming service, mm -hmm. you know, matches some of these ideas? Because algorithms, we know, right, are just going to keep giving us oh, yeah. things like we watch. So I'm wondering where the ethical part lies with 
with the folks at, at like Netflix, for instance? Um, I, I made my friend in the back mind agree that Netflix is going to be driven by a profit motive, right. whether we want them to be or not. So I think it's up to audiences to make ethical choices. Like, I, I don't think Netflix is going to do anything to change that algorithm because it works. And they're raking in money and subscribers, and I don't think that's going to change. But I do think that as an audience, like, you know when you watch certain things that the story is a little too good to be true, a little too pat, a little too sensational. You kind of know that. You have a gut feeling about it. And sometimes you watch anyway because sometimes it's delicious and sometimes you <laughs> don't, right? Um, so I, I do think it's it's more a responsibility of consumers to do better because I don't believe Netflix will. That was simple. Yes. <laughs> yes, please. Um, this may be a bit off topic for you, but I'm curious. Uh, I've given a lot of thought to why, as a culture, we are so fascinated with all of this. Why we're so fascinated. And I'm curious your yeah. thoughts around that. I thought a lot about that in the past few weeks since while I guess told me to come talk about this. Um, I think there's something about trying to understand the nature of evil that we're all curious about. The nature of evil in others, the potential of it in ourselves, uh, which is a frightening thought. Um, I think we're fascinated by victims. What must that scenario be like? We put ourselves in the, in the place of victims and, and we try to imagine what their experiences were, how horrific that must be. Um, I think we do, often, like many of us do care about the criminal justice system, we want to see it work better than it does, and we want to see more justice and not less. So I think you could look at it from the perpetrator's perspective, the victim's perspective, the detective's perspective, and you, you get something out of it, you get something out of a true crime story depending on whose perspective you take. Uh, so I think really just depends on the story, which part captures you, I think. Yeah, I, I find um, watching true crime stories to be, I guess I believe them less than the, the ones I read. I'm mm -hmm. a huge fan of Dan Rohl, and okay. um, I loved her stuff. I don't think I've even read anything since she died, but um, the fact that she would go back and tell the whole psychological story of the victims and of the um, the killers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she did one on Ted Bundy. She knew Ted Bundy personally, mm -hmm. but she uh, she just had a way of and show us pictures. You know, she'd go back and she put pictures in the middle of the mm -hmm. book and everything. So I think that's what drew me to her is that whole psychological and, and that, I guess that's what draws me to true crime is that psychological sure. thing about you know how how do these people behave like this and I, and I think that's why she's just always been. Yeah. yeah. The Stranger Beside Me, I think, is one of the best books about true crime. The Stranger Beside Me, she yeah. wrote about ten years yeah, ago. Mm -hmm. But she also did yeah. that one. There's a she one about a, a woman killer that was really uh, good. She shot her. Um, she shot her children because oh, wow. cause she wanted to be with her boyfriend and he didn't want kids. Oh, wow. She fought them. She shot them. Face, you know, right in the back. <laughs> Anyhow, she she must have had amazing access interview wise documents, family histories, interviews, to be able to write a psychological hit, like history of somebody, because you have to know them pretty well to, to do that truthfully. Yeah, the research, I think, was, again, what drew me to her style and to right. her as, a, as a writer. I think that's why, for me, Cold Blood is so fascinating, because he does try in the second half of the book to get in the minds of the killers a little bit, tells their backstory, and gives a lot of information about where they came from. Again, at this point, but that's not all true, but, um, yeah. um, I was going to say that a, a true crime that I didn't think of as true crime, but it's actually in the title, the Say, um, Say Nothing by Patrick Radden Keith. Oh, God, um, it's so good. So, right? It's really, really good. It's all about, it's about Ireland and the troubles, you know, the oh, fight wow. between Protestants and Catholics, but it talks specifically about one family, and, um, it's just really well, it's not that advocacy journalism, I'm sure he wouldn't call it that, but it's, I think it's a really good example. And on the more salacious side, I really love the podcast, um, Welcome to My Fantasy, about Chippendale um, dancers and the guy, do you hear no. that? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, the guy who started it died, sort of, 
under strange circumstances. Really? And that's already a movie on Netflix. Oh, it's on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Cash. Um, you've said so many things tonight that have just kind of stuck in my brain that I want to think about uh, after tonight is over. Um, but you mentioned the attention economy. Yeah. And that's something that I think about quite a bit with social media, with how our students are engaged with various things that are, it's just, it's just the nagging on the periphery of our minds that we should be somewhere else doing something else, checking email, checking Twitter, checking whatever. Um, and I'm wondering, I had never thought about it until you just said it, how relatively recently documentaries are using music to cue our feelings, mm -hmm. which is a manipulation, which is also what social media is based on these small manipulations. Can you talk about, in your experience with documentaries, and I, I don't, I'm gonna butcher the term, but cinema verite, uh, Real, real life film, or can you talk about in your experience or your, your study or research the, the, the various phases of documentary productions, of, of just turning a camera on and recording as opposed to going and really editing, you know, mm -hmm. and saving, like the jinx has the big reveal at the end, you know, saving that right. for the, you know, that kind of thing, and cueing the music and all of that. Um, I'm ashamed to report, this is too far answer. I'm ashamed to report, I don't know a ton about documentary making, but I have a good friend that does, who just left. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, right. Um, I, I don't work on the film side of things, uh, and thanks to you for documentaries, and had to go to choral practice. Um, but so, even so, what about like in written exposés about true crime? I mean, the way that the flashy things get our attention, uh, or the way they live on social media, or the way the podcast cues music, or yeah, I guess I, one thing I kind of trip over myself with a lot is if it's not entertaining in this environment, it's not going to get any traction. <laughs> and so, um, if you don't have some shiny graphics or some emotional pulls here and there. Is your story going to be heard because you've made it, you've created it, it's important to you for some reason, you wanted to get attention, so how do you do it? So you almost have to play the game a little bit. It's just how much can you play the game without getting consumed by it? I think that's where I get really tripped up. I don't have a good answer for it. I think there's a line there, but I'm not sure where it should be drawn. Um, yes, sir. Uh, it concerns me the way I when I read about something, about a crime, and that I go uh, right now to that one in South Carolina, the guy murders people. No, the Murdoch. The Murdoch, yeah. yeah. About, my first thought was not about, gosh, these people were killed. It was like, can you imagine the number of people that are rushing down there to do a documentary or are going to write a book about it? And it puts a distance between the event. I'm, I'm waiting for the movie. I'm not going to read. Stuff. I'm going to wait on the documentary. And it, it somehow, I'm disengaged or disconnected from what is happening or what is happening in the present time because it's all going to be filtered for me and given back to me. Right. Um, and part of that is because of how popular true crime is, like their stories are going to sell really quickly. And so there's just such a huge market that that's going to continue to happen, I think. Which is why, it's why I think it's so important to try to do this well, try to do it ethically. Because otherwise it feels like vultures descending on prey, I think. Uh, yeah, lay back and then. Could you talk more about guardrails that would have to be implemented for advocacy journalism in a way that protects the practice from being heavily polarized and politicized? Because I could imagine Rachel Maddox saying, oh, I'm presenting a piece that advocate journalism that's not objective, and then it would look really different if Rush Limbaugh did the same thing, but they're both saying, well, this is advocacy. Because um, I understand the, the, the criticism about objectivity is that it's even possible, but there are some safeguards that try and supply objectivity does have. Um, so I just love to hear like more, more thoughts, I guess, around how somebody would practice that with integrity and prevent themselves from falling into preconceived notions that they're trying to prove. Mm -hmm. 
Well, one thing I would say, and this again might be a bit cynical, I'm not sure if it wouldn't be politically polarized. It, it, it probably just would be viewed that way depending on where you stand politically. I think the guardrail that I think is most useful is the transparency, transparency aspect. Um, making some of your transcripts available or letting your audience in on your process and letting them know how you how you found this information, where you found this information, why you think it's good, what you left out. I think all of those types of discussions you can have with your audience helps build trust. So even if someone maybe disagrees with you politically, they can still see that you gathered your information in an ethical, upright way. Because I don't think we're in a situation where we can create something that's going to be non-political. I think mean, we're just this is the era that we're in. But I do think we can be transparent with our process, and that can help people trust what we have to say, even if they may not agree with all of it. Do you think that's why serial transcended political lines and our tribal behavior? Because there was that constant reflection where Sarah Koenig was asking him, is this the right thing to do? Am I? And Benjamin does that too, you know? They're both great at it. Yeah. I completely agree. I'd be curious to see, like, the political breakdown of the viewers or the listeners of Serial. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in a bubble, I'm a college professor. Most of my friends are leaning really heavily one direction, right? So I'm not as familiar with what the other side is doing, and that's a problem, I think. But um, I, I do think that transparency is, is part of what makes their, their work so compelling. Mm -hmm. Sir, you had a question? I was just going to make a brief observation. You use the word objectivity two or three times. I would argue there's no such thing as objectivity. It doesn't matter if you're the right or the left. Yeah. You choose what you present. I think that's, I, I actually agree with you. I think we, we strive toward object, objectivity. Some news reporters strive towards it. I'm not sure it's something that's attain, attainable. That's why I'm such a big advocate for advocacy journalism, where you say, this is where I'm coming from. Take the story for what it's worth. Here's your grain of salt. So I agree with, I agree with you on that. Yes. What percentage would you say of uh, true crime things actually ever come out in a book form rather than going from the newspaper to the television to all these different things? Um, I don't know the percentage, but I, my understanding is podcasts and documentaries are they, like they're going through the roof. And while true crime books still have a place, I don't think they're growing the same way this, these digital media are growing. That's my understanding based on what I've read so far. So they may not supplant the old detective or mystery novels and things that, right. <laughs> that people still love. Right. You could probably make them faster too. Podcasts and docuseries, you can right. it's probably a faster medium to create than writing a book. Yeah. Just wonder if there's any difference in the way people perceive the danger, whether they're watching it or hearing it. I would think that mm -hmm. luridness or vividness and just and the repetition that can be happens in the visual medium creates to me more of a body that's like group. Whereas if you're hearing it, you're you're filling in things and it, it's it could go either way, but I'm just wondering if anybody studied that it seems like it might have different effects on people. Um, the studies have read of meaning world syndrome all have to do with television. So it's very it's a theory based on a visual medium, and so I don't know if similar work done with radio. I would, I would align myself with you. I would say it's not going to be as compelling. And we have more worlds where people are literally. Yeah, that's right. That, that's kind of getting back to the clue and hot and cool. Uh, which which media is which? Uh, you know, the visual engages us mm -hmm. directly in a way that. Passivity of the printed page does. And that's right. We're a little calmer, a little more rational, maybe when we're reading, and much more emotionally charged when we're watching. At least I am, I think. Two more. Yeah, Richard. Um, in terms of the fact that docuseries and podcasts are the more popular medium of keeping up with true crime, do you think there's a future for advocacy? Journalism and an age where visual mediums or auditory mediums are more popular, or do you think that might fade out and you might just focus more on 
Netflix documentaries that are churned out over and over again, and they get all the views, are, are going to be the majority of true crime. I am not that naive. But I do think there, there is a space for people who want to try to change the world by making documentaries about true crime. So I think that that route does exist if you choose it. I still know that it will ever be as, as large as the more sensational popcorn type documentaries. Yeah. No stringent critiques? Nothing. <laughs> anyway, I really appreciate y'all listening. If you have any questions, come see me afterwards. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, and, and thank you, Dr. Meadows, for that. That was, that, as I said, left me with so much to think about. I've got three hardcovers of uh, the other Dr. Gilmer I'd love to give out tonight. Uh, so if you want to, is there a hand? Anybody else? So, that one is yeah. so they're all spoken for, but uh, thank you all so much for coming. Our next event is going to be Wednesday, March 15th, uh, same time, same place, um, and it is going to be by Dr. Laura Jones and the Health and Wellness Department, and it will be about the role of mental health in the U.S. legal system, and so it should be very, very interesting, and uh, I hope you can all join us, and then in April, there will be a conversation uh, with myself and, and Dr. Benjamin Gilmer. Um, about research, about writing, and about being Dr. Gilson. So thank you all so much. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>